Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Thompson. Welcome to the first of the third series of these Lockdown Lunch and Learn webinars. The title of webinar 13 is how do we stay bonded as a team through change? So my name's Laura and without further ado, we'll start with the screen share. And uh, I thought it might be quite interesting to view this topic through the lens of the miracle of human memory. And this really stuck with me, this phrase from Daniel Goleman, who was the uh, pretty much seen as the founder of emotional intelligence. Whenever we retrieve a memory, the brain rewrites it a bit, updating the past according to our present concerns and understanding. And isn't it fascinating when you stop and think about how I wonder how we will recall and what we will recollect when we view this when there's a bit of distance in between, um, let's say, this time next year and the current day to day. So it took us a while to think about what's actually going to be the topic that kicks this off. And I think if, like uh, some of the people we've been interacting with, the recent events have actually sort of disturbed us a little bit more than maybe how we were feeling at the start of um, this period of change, how we emerge as a team is going to be even more important. Because if we emerge feeling resentful and bitter about the current circumstance that we might find ourselves in compared to everyone else, then actually we're no good as a team in terms of being able to work together with whatever the new normal that is facing us anyway. So how do we stay bonded as a team, whether that's a formal professional team, whether it's an informal domestic team, whether you are the team of one and your team is all your kind of friends and family and business network. Um, let's have a look at some things that might help. I'll tell you what, I might just see what's going on for everyone in my life at the moment. Okay, so she's having a nightmare because her ceiling is too short to do exercise in. Uh, they're having a nightmare because their ceiling is too tall to dust. Oh my gosh, is there any actual optimum ceiling height for us to be locked in with? It's a little bit like Goldilocks. I haven't really found anyone yet who has got a set of circumstances that is perfectly right for getting the best out of this particular scenario. And yet it's so easy to think about how, how hot or how cold my current scenario is. So I think this next phase of transformation has got its own set of challenges as some restrictions are lifted for some, but not others. How the team remains bonded despite the differences is gonna be key to how we emerge through change. Do we think that this decade is gonna have waves of change happening at different stages for different people? there's a high likelihood. So being able to understand how to process that now might be quite useful for us. The brain is ruthlessly efficient at editing the information it selects to store in our long-term memory. And over time, those long-term memories become the autobiography of our life, upon which my identity and personality is based. And if my identity is based on my behavior over the last seven days, that's not actually what I would want my personality to be based upon, because I'm finding myself having conversations and shouting at various people that I wouldn't dream of having done beforehand but this particular scenario is probably testing us in ways that we haven't been on the right training course for. So knowing how long-term memory works might help process these different short-term challenges just a little bit easier. So there's a lot going on. How do we make this work? Title of this is some practical tips staying bonded as a team, no matter how casual, informal, permanent, temporary that situation may be. These lunch and learns, as always, are a space to learn and just revel in the joy of learning and keeping our brains stimulated with some productive stuff. So as always, it's judgment free, one size fits one. Keep the stuff you like, ditch the stuff you don't, pass on to others those the things that you think might be useful. Hopefully you'll find these friendly, light and positive and always rooted in commercial practicality. So for anyone that has a team call beta following this, you'll be able to hopefully put something immediately into effect. Focused on what we can do, so the three objectives we'll look at are practical suggestions to guide your thinking. Only you have your life. This is just some guidance as we're steering our way through some new stuff. And these are tips to help you thrive whilst working from home, um, no matter how makeshift or temporary your space. So today we're looking at how do I develop the mindset to embrace difference through uneven 
choppy change? How come I might have a set of circumstances that is different from their set of circumstances? And how do we still work together harmoniously, even though I might be feeling really resentful about the unevenness of the change um, as it emerges for, for each of us? How might I then ensure I use language and have an etiquette around our online meetings, whether family or professional, that include and unite a team culture? So as and when we do meet in person again, we are looking forward to that rather than feeling like there might be some stuff that's built up. And what might be some frameworks just to keep in mind to keep strategic through these tricky operational times. Um, and uh, my suggestion at the end is being able to think strategically through tricky operational times is likely to be a key interview question, um, uh, certainly by the time we get to the mid of this decade. So doesn't matter how good I was at dealing with team culture and team spirit and the role I have with it previously. If I'm going to channel the mindset of a fox here, so forever learning, forever looking at new ways to do things as the situation evolves, I'm like a panda, always sticking with what I used to do. If I was to channel the fox mindset, I wonder what might be worth a think or a rethink to maybe refresh some of the beliefs and um contributions that i've made to teams over the years because actually there's something quite unique about this current environment so how might i keep my rate of internal change so that as everything is evolving around me i am fit and relevant for the environment so i feel like i'm keeping up with what's going on so how do i embrace difference through uneven change well let's just flip something so for anyone that's ever been involved in learning development teaching whatever we all would have learned about ebbinghouse's law of forgetting so i think it was from the late 1800s and the idea that pretty much 80 percent of everything we learn every day gets lost during sleep um, and then what we recall is then the stuff that is kind of standout memories or stuff that we've consciously chosen to learn so more recent research has had a look at memory recall so after 20 minutes of watching um, a, a bit of bite-sized learning nearly half of that learning is lost so by the time you've had a quick lunch break you've forgotten the 11 o'clock um, TED talk that you might have watched after a night's sleep and a full day nearly 70 percent of that learning is lost after a month uh, nearly 80 percent of that learning is lost so you keep about 20 percent and after 60 days 90 percent of what you took from that ted talk for example is lost now we've pretty much had 60 days so far in this current period of transformation so that's quite a lot of stuff that's come into our brain and our memory has lost the ability to recall it so what any learning and development person will be looking at is all right well how can we follow up to ensure that the key messages are revised and therefore retained so that people can recall it when they need to and um, the average learner retains only 10 percent of new information after 60 days so here's the key thing there will be an awful lot that we'll be learning that will just disappear in the midst of time by having to think about well what's the stuff that's likely to be recalled and what's the stuff that's not likely to be recalled how can I enjoy my day to day more if for anyone it's feeling a little bit like a grind and a bit grueling at the moment? So let's flip the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. Rather than it being a flaw that our brains forget stuff, what an asset that our brain actually forgets about 90% of its day to day experience. However, what are the key learning points that I'm revising inside my head every day at the moment? If every day I'm going to bed going, oh my God, it's a nightmare, then guess what? That is going to be a nightmarish period of my life when I look back in one, five, ten years time. If actually each day I can scramble some sense of positivity from it as a way of then recalling that day, then actually the way I look back is going to have some rose tinted as opposed to a thorny period of my life. So let's flip it. The brain pretty much forgets most of what's going through it anyway. So let's flip that and view that as an asset as opposed to a flaw. What are some of the things that are likely to prompt some emotion at the moment? Well, I'd never heard of this before and it fascinated me. So in the late 1960s, a behavioural psychologist, John Adams, um, came up with this theory of something that's called equity theory and the impact that has on morale and performance, whether this is paid or domestic work, whatever your scenario is at the moment. And basically, the maths is the motivation of someone is positively correlated and linked to perception of justice, and fair treatment practiced by the management or government or boss, colleagues, friends, family, universe. So it's this 
balance that we seek is what I'm pouring in the input fair uh, to equitable to the amount of compensation I get at the other end so the outcome so it's a set of scales that potentially we have so input outcome so maybe at the start of change when everyone goes in it together it all actually feels quite equitable we're all sort of you know in the scenario together however the key thing about equity theory is if we only just compared with ourselves, then that might be quite easy to achieve some balance but the thing about us humans is we look at the neighbors we look at what's going on around so we refer to others so with this is where the individual compares their input out balance with other employees in the organization called a referent. Um, and so if my output to input ratio is lower than yours, I feel a bit under rewarded and be a bit demotivated. This creates an equity tension and it creates an unease, which may come out in, for example, in envy. When my output input ratio is equal to yours or those around me, perfect equity is present and I feel motivated. We're kind of all in it together. If my ratio is better than yours, I may actually feel over rewarded and again some equity tension to de can develop and this creates an unease which may present itself in feelings of guilt or a bit of awkwardness if suddenly I see others in my team having uh, less freedom than maybe I've just been able to experience. So. I found it quite useful to look at, well, actually, just from a very basic point of view, why might this current period of the change curve actually be a little bit more tricky than maybe earlier on where it was sharper and shock, more shocking, the change. But actually, in terms of how a team might interact with each other, this might require the management, the leadership bit. And what can I do to create as much equity or perception of equity um, around? Let's have a look at some ways of thinking. Could it be that actually the ability to control my thoughts and shift towards internal equity could be pretty useful for this next decade ahead? We may have all entered the chrysalis together, but each butterfly is going to emerge at slightly different stages because that's nature. So if it's feeling that things are a little bit unfair at the moment, how can we restore some balance in our minds so we can crack on and enjoy and think about what we want to remember as opposed to what we don't want to remember? Here are three things, just really simplistic. How about wallowing in it for a controlled period of time? Thanks to my wonderful colleague, Lindsay Thompson Wright, she calls this a pity party. So just get it all out. Set a five minute timer and think about all the unjust, unfair situations in your scenario at the moment. This might not what, what you want to do on a team check-in, but maybe this is something you encourage yourself to do or a friend who you're on the phone with. This is get it all out. And what that does is it then removes its power. Flip it so it becomes an input. Actually, by handling all of this unwanted stuff, I am learning, deciding and realising some things that actually I might never have had the insight to know just how important it is for the future. So what are actually this input at some point is go, this outcome. So this stuff that feels like it's happening, that is unfair, actually, that's the learning. That's that's the handling. That is the input you're putting into it. And also, if I were to switch the outcome measure and almost trick myself to feel grateful. So think of one thing that you've enjoyed, however mildly, recently, and cast your net to think of all the other people who may not have been able to do that. It's really tricky to play cards continually with yourself. Um, and it's really uh, easy to be able to do some things that maybe someone else might find a little bit trickier. So these are three really simple things all with the pursuit of shifting towards a feeling of internal equity, which could be quite useful for the decade ahead, because it's unlikely there will be formal start and formal stop to any change that will happen, whether it's global or whether it's a small corporate shift. And the third thing, it is easier to embrace difference when you carry a mindset of abundance rather than scarcity. If I believe that the amount of luck in the world is limited, then I'm going to get a little bit edgy when I feel someone around me getting in some luck because it might tap into some fear of, well, if you have luck, then there's less for me. But actually, if we shift that from a scarcity into an abundance, which is luck is limitless. So you having some luck in no way impacts the, the likelihood, the statistical likelihood of me having some luck. And if when, when we believe that luck is limitless, it's much easier to stay happy, motivated and calm as we see waves uneven change happen around us because stuff happening over there 
doesn't actually reduce the likelihood of stuff happening over here with you. I found this quite useful when thinking about healthy eating. If I believe that there is only one cupcake in the world ever available for me, I'm going to eat every cupcake I see because it's a scarce resource. When I consider that actually there are unending amount of cakes in my life ahead of me that I could consume, suddenly the draw to grab that cupcake is reduced because actually there are limitless cupcakes if I really wanted a cupcake in my life's journey ahead. So suddenly the power of that single cupcake is reduced. So how about if I were to lift that from food <laughs> into maybe some other bigger areas of my, my, of my life? So money. So if I have a scarcity around my thoughts around money, there's never going to be enough. I've got to compete to stay on top. Um, other people, if they get money, means there's less from me. Then actually, that's a lot of heat that is surrounding the concept of money. If I bring more of an abundant perspective about money, there'll always be money. There'll always be the opportunity to earn. Actually, you earning lots is more likely to put me on the trajectory of earning money rather than you earning lots is preventing me to. Because what that does is it keeps your world bigger whereas the scarcity thinking keeps it sort of shrunk. I always remember someone saying to me how the army are trained is always look after the people next to you to ensure they're all right. And then you're guaranteed that the whole team arrives safe. Whereas if I'm only thinking about me, I don't know what potentially is going on behind me. So that abundant thinking, not only is it useful in terms of um, thinking about the things that maybe you want to happen in your life, it creates a better, better team environment. So how do I embrace difference through uneven change? Well, a lot of this day to day stuff we're going to forget anyway. So how is it that you want to remember this period of time? Because this is the first for us all. We may have ongoing periods of this, but this first um, was, was, will always stick in our mind because it's the first time we've ever experienced this level of unprecedented change. So this current phase has highlights potentially the impact that equity or the feeling of unfairness can potentially have on morale and performance. Shifting towards internal equity could be a useful skill for this next decade. So being at peace with what you have and maybe adjusting the way you view it. And it's easier to embrace difference when you have a mindset of abundance rather than scarcity. So just because someone else in the team has got something that I want doesn't in any way limit the chances that I might at some point get that. So objective two, how do we include everyone and unite our team culture? Um, here's something, I love this phrase, memory is not just the imprint of the past time upon us, a biography, it is the keeper of what is meaningful for our deepest hopes and fears. So memory and the stuff we recall is almost like sort of survival lessons, really, for what's important. Um, I don't know about you, but I think a lot of children, I certainly did, I have a memory of being forgotten, and left behind. Sorry, mum. Because, uh, yeah, so waiting at the school gates and mum hadn't arrived. And I can really remember that. I mean, she still feels dreadful about it now, you know, 30 odd years on, 40 odd years on. But I, I can remember that as well. And being forgotten... We really remember that. So on um, our screen catch ups, how might we just have to be a bit fox and ensure that we don't forget to include everyone? How might we need to plan to ensure that everyone has been asked a question? Because the three people that were forgotten will remember that. The 10 people who were remembered and asked, it was just a meeting. But the three people who weren't asked, that will be a meeting that will stick in their mind because it hurts when you're forgotten. And it's really tricky for one person to ensure, well, we'll look at some tips, to ensure that everyone's included. So we all have a responsibility to ensure everyone is included. So next time you're on a team catch up, um, tend the team as well as contribute as well because it really hurts when we're forgotten. It's really easy to have a lovely intimate catch up when there's only three or four of you. And in fact, people you know, are saying that they're, they're having some fantastic, meaningful conversations as a team when small really tricky to create that feeling of team culture when there's many of you it takes longer to check in with everyone so you might need to adjust it and it's easier to forget people in the nicest possible way i remember being fascinated by a piece of research called lurker number no. seven and it was a piece of research based in a real world environment that suggests that once a meeting gets to more than seven people sitting around the table it's easier for people to lurk 
and my lack of participation if I'm either person eight or nine or ten is less obvious whereas when there's only seven of us it's really obvious if I haven't spoken up in that meeting but if there's 12 of us you know there might be five people we don't really say much but you won't notice it because there's enough chat going on with the seven with online meetings there's going to be even less evidence to sort of check to uh, uh, to check everyone's been included so any more than seven on a call it can be easy to forget who's contributed and who hasn't just the simple act of jotting down everyone's names just to ensure to nudge your memory that everyone has had a chance to speak will create an action oriented culture because if my team meetings are starting to feel like oh yeah well we just go on and we just listen to the same three people my motivation to take action after that meeting is going to deplete over time so an action oriented culture is where everyone feels like they've got skin in the game and uh, contributing to a conversation is key to that well especially in the virtual environment that many of us are still in now Second point is um, I love collecting stories over the years and I've done some stuff with um, teachers over the years and this story stuck in my mind. So it's the power of a name. So let's just get really basic on this. Your name is the most important word in the world to you. Why is that? It was the very first word that you learned. It wasn't the first word that you said. That was probably mama, dada. But your name was the very first word that you learned to get your needs met. So you would have learned as a very, very young infant that when your name is you, uh, used and you look, you get something. So your name is the most important word in the world to you, uh, word in the world to you. So you will notice every time your name is spelt wrong or said incorrectly, it's the most important word in the world to you. Therefore, it is the most important word in the world of the team to make sure I get right. So a teacher every September has to memorise 30 new names and personalities. How do they do that? this story stuck out to me there's an inspiring teacher who um, I got chatting to after an event I did and she said that um, I asked her the question because you know I was trying to remember people's names on stuff and I said well, what do you do as a teacher then and she said okay here's the trick I've learned on the Friday of the first week back in September before falling asleep I do a mental register of all the kids in my new class I know that the five or so names that I struggle to recall are probably the children that I haven't connected with as much as others otherwise I would have remembered them clearer I then make a concerted effort on Monday week two to focus my attention on those five kids. I do the same on the second Friday and again and again and again in a, until I can roll all 30 names off by heart. And it was just creating this slide earlier on, that realisation of by heart really kicked in with me. So when we remember things by heart, it's because it really has connected on all sorts of levels, not just cognitively, but our values and all that kind of stuff as well. So the power of a name will become even more apparent when we, when we are in this 2D world, because that's the way that you call my attention rather than eye contact, because we can't see where we're all looking at anyway. So the third point is, maximize the space for radiators in the team and minimize the space for drains a wonderful friend lex introduced me to this a number of years ago radiators or drains um because we tend to become the average of we people as but we spend our time with so am i spending time with radiators people that radiate positive energy so you feel warm and lifted and cozy when you've spent time with them um either phone video whatever or are you spending lots of time with drains? <laughs> People who drain your energy away and actually you feel more tired after an interaction than before you started. So uh, the more that we can do in our team environments, whether domestic, professional, whatever, to uh, maximise the airtime for radiator type of interactions as opposed to draining interactions, then um, the more energy that will be kind of move, 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 um, being able to sort of swirl around um, and if it uh, I remember my dad saying something about how uh, if you can't spot the difficult character in the room uh, it might be you <laughs> so if you can't spot the people maybe in your life who are draining at the moment then uh, maybe it's you <laughs> and having to think about how can I actually do my bit to radiate um, so uh, uh, to, to, to put out energy as opposed to drag in energy. So this doesn't mean that we can't listen to each other's problems, but it's if it's the fifth time the exact same script has been said, potentially at that point, that would be described as a draining conversation as opposed to more of a, it's not great, so what am I going to do? I'm going to give it a go. 
so radiator versus drain i know uh, other people have said that to me as well they, they really like that phrase it's quite memorable so how do we include everyone and unite our team culture especially when we have potentially different members of the team having different scenarios start to evolve in front of them so memory and what we recall isn't just the imprint of what happened it also we remember the stuff to then learn lessons to be able to crack future challenges that we may be in front of and one of the uh, one of the big things is is we remember when we've forgotten it hurts plan how to ensure everyone is involved our name is the most important word in the world to us it is the very first word we learn to make our way through the world so it's the most important word to ensure that you use especially when we're in an online team environment and maximizing the space for radiating conversations as opposed to draining conversations conversations is not only good for our own general day-to-day -day, but it also means as a team we're practicing more energy energizing conversations and the stuff that kind of drains us so the third objective how do I keep strategic during tricky operational times um, I, I was looking for stuff online about how what the particular things that um, stick out in a lifetime anyway and um, the things that, that seem to be most memorable are those that are meaningful, significant and colourful. So I've got some variety to it as well. So you in the passage of time may forget actually what you ate for breakfast each morning during this current bit of transformation, but you might remember that random kitchen disco that you had in the middle of the day that you never normally would have been able to have had. And that kitchen disco bit might be the one thing that you recall in a decade's time when you hear that bit of music again, and you won't recall some of the more draining, minutiae stuff that's going on at the moment. So could it be that thinking a bit strategically is gonna, gonna help me tolerate and thrive through some of the challenges that uh, we, we, we are experiencing at the moment? So let's just back up the track, truck. Why is thinking strategically useful in the first place? Well, my personal thought on this is being able to think beyond the here and now is likely to be considered a premium skill for the future. I can't think of a single project that at some point is going to be initiated that doesn't require the sheer energizing force of being able to think above and beyond what's happening now. Of course, you need an operational mindset to be able to manage things, but that ability to see a little bit further than the here and now, I think is gonna be a really key skill. So labeling what you're doing now as a conscious act of thinking strategically might then help recall it a little bit later if someone asks you for example in an interview or in a pitch um, give me an example of how you've thought strategically um, some of the stuff you might be doing now might not feel particularly strategic but what is strategic thinking it is anticipating stuff setting yourself some challenges to, uh, 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 and thinking how might we handle that challenge interpreting all the data that's around you with a long longer perspective deciding what to focus on and what to ditch aligning with your intentions compared with those around you with the team learning from other people with whom might be new teachers for you because you might have been really competent at what you were doing before and are feeling less competent at what you're doing now so that strategic thinking it's got nothing to do with age or experience it's the mindset of being able to think above and beyond what's going on now doesn't mean that day-to-day -day operations isn't important my gosh that's what keeps the world spinning but the act of being able to think above and beyond that I think is going to be one of the well-paid skills in the future so what can I can do now in the most toughest of operational circumstances to really focus on how I'm practicing being able to think strategically the long view because if we go to the ultimate strategic thinking which is this day in your whole lifetime this is just a stage of life the impact that this stage has on your ongoing life is entirely up to each and every one of us the older we are the less percentage time a particular stage represents which I know is a bit of a, a simple thing to think about but it shocked me when I got the calculator out and worked out how many weeks are there in 40 years and um, what therefore does eight weeks represent and eight weeks for a 40 year old represents 0.003% of lifespan so far. Now, you might not have been thinking about life from the moment that you were born, but that's a tiny, tiny drop in the ocean of all that experience that you've had so far. So 
to what extent am I going to let this current operational challenge define some of the bigger perspectives and pictures that I have? Because my life is more than just 0.003% of time. There is much more that has gone on before, during and ahead that actually then might help keep a bit of perspective with this. So the third bit maybe is thinking about imagining a future where you have been asked to recollect how you handled this challenge. Um, I might I'm going to make the assumption that if an interviewer were to hear someone say actually I found it all really easy because I had no challenges and everything I wanted just happened might not be the optimum interview response so thinking about all the stuff that's kind of going on but with a slightly different more strategic lens which is during this time I am learning some different facets of my personality that have surprised me I have appreciated that certain things maybe are more or less important than potentially I'd thought before. I made the decision or I am deciding about certain things moving forward. I am understanding things with a different perspective and I'm enabling things. These little um, verbs or whatever they are, I'm supposed to be doing English teaching, these descriptive words <laughs> um, might then help package some of the day-to-day -day minutia actually with a bit more of a strategic intent which is whether it was um sitting there for half an hour thinking about what you're going to do in the future that is deciding the new version of yourself that's strategic thinking so imagining a future where you recollected how you handled some stuff might help in turn enjoy each day because 90 percent of what you've done today you're going to forget anyway it's the 10 percent that you're revising in your head that is going to be how you look back on this time and decide how you made it count so how do I influence a conversation? Oh, <laughs> how do I ensure that I think strategically? Being able to think strategically is likely to be a premium skill for the future. So it's worth thinking consciously about it. Remembering this is just a stage of life. So the ultimate strategic thinking is thinking about the drop in the ocean of time that this current stretch actually is having. So it's up to me to decide the impact it has in terms of defining my life afterwards. And imagining the future in hindsight and recollecting how I handle this challenge might then help uh, make some more ruthless decisions about what I allow to let bother me and what I allow to let slide. So in the words of fabulous Dr Zeus, sometimes you would never know the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. You know, it's those things that you look back and go, oh my God, do you remember when? And it might have been a total nightmare at the time it happened, but it makes you laugh when you look at it in hindsight. And then you think, if only I'd enjoyed that moment a little bit more, because I hadn't realised at the time that that was going to be something that defined April or whatever it may be. So this period of transformation is testing us and developing our strengths in some ways that no training course could have been put together this time last year. We are having to learn how to handle not only our own stuff, but how that compares with those around us and for a team to emerge well full of respect admiration and energy for each other rather than bitterness resentness and sourness against each other it's going to be key to practice some concepts that are going to stretch us and teach us some new aspects of ourselves however honing these skills now could mean we emerge even more skilled to maximize our potential in the years ahead and in all those teams in your life to come so keep human stay foxy how will i embrace difference when this next period of change may be uneven how am i going to ensure everyone is included so we unite us as a team and how will i keep the long view in sight during the current day to day so keep foxy look after yourself i hope you've enjoyed this session and uh see you at the next one Bye bye